Enjoy this message courtesy of Overcomers Assembly Studio. In life, you've got to make a choice, right or wrong. We pray that you are blessed as you make the right choices in life. Hallelujah. Glory be to God in the highest. It is another time to study at his feet. It's my prayer tonight that God of heaven we open our eyes of understanding that we may be able to see that which he wants us to see today in the name of Jesus Christ. I bring greetings to everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shall we pray before we go ahead? Eternal King of glory, our Father who art in heaven, we worship, we adore you. We exalt your holy name because you are God. You are not a man that should lie concerning your promises. Thank you, Lord, because your promises in Christ are yea and amen. Heaven and earth will pass away. But no one judge of your world will pass away without accomplishing that we have said before to do. And so, Father, we are trusting you tonight again that you will send your word to our life that I will bring the war in our life in the name of Jesus Christ. And tonight, again, O Lord, open our eyes to the scripture and let the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. And Lord, let your name alone be glorified. Even when we shall be rounded off this session tonight, O Lord, let us be able to give all glory back unto you because it belongs to you. Thank you, wonderful God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen and amen. I, I greet you again in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is another wonderful time to study in the presence of God. And we are in August already. This is the second week in August. Last week was the uh, 1st of August. Today is 8th of August already. And the August is going gradually also. <laughs> we bless the name of the Lord for the topic he has given us to us to study the month of August again, talking about fellowship with God. And we laid the foundation last week that the whole essence of our creation is to fellowship with God. If there's only one thing that God cherishes most in us, is for us to fellowship with him. We remember in the days where God, I mean, when God created Adam and Eve, the Bible says at the cool of the day, God normally comes down to see them, to have fellowship with them. And so one of the most important things or important reason why God has created you and I is to have fellowship with him. And last week, we look at one important way by which you can secure a good fellowship with God, that even as individual, God has created us individually, he has made us uniquely. So we are unique in our own right. We are unique. The psalmist says, we are wonderfully and fearfully made. 
So we are unique, each one of us in our own right. So we must learn how to relate with God one on one basis. We must learn how to relate with God one on one basis. Last week we looked at, you know, in the days of the Old Testament, when it was the priest and the high priest that have the sole privilege to relate with God and transpire what happens to the people. But now we have direct access to God individually, personally. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. He says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The veil of the temple has been broken. Remember, when Jesus Christ died, the veil of the temple was broken into two, giving us access directly to God. So you and I, we don't need a priest. We are the priest of our life. We don't need any prophet. We are the prophet of our life. So we are in charge of our life. So we have direct access to God, to the throne of grace, where we can get obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. So we don't need any prayer contractor. We don't need, it's good for us to pray with one another, pray for one another. But more importantly, for us to secure that relationship that God carries so much, we got to got to set aside time to be alone with God, with God. And we looked at being alone with God has to be intentional. You know, we have to be determined to do it. We have to be intentional about it. We have it cost us time, it cost us money. Remember, a few months ago when we started the cost of discipleship, you know. This, this is also one of the cause of discipleship, you know, with the cause of something. Salvation came to us free because Jesus Christ paid the price. So every other thing, sanctification, our uh, holiness, our, our work with the Lord, we cost us something. And if actually we cherish those things, we must be ready to pay the price. So it cost us time. It, we must be determined about it. And we must be ready to do it. John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So we must learn, we must cultivate the habit to always come apart. Even when Jesus Christ was here on earth, his disciples, so many times he would call them to come apart. The Bible says, even in, in before the day break, it will be alone somewhere. Communication fellowship with the Father before the day break, before he will not join the disciples. So those are those things that we need to learn to do. We need to be alone with God because that is where we can learn to fellowship with God. Because in the place of fellowship with God, many things happen to our advantage. Many things happen to our advantage. And that's why if we don't do it, we deny ourselves of so many privileges that ordinarily supposed to come to us. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5, and Matthew 6, and 33, it says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So we must seek for God first and all his righteousness and, and all his righteousness. Then all other things shall be added unto us. So today, we want to study about people that had good fellowship with God and how their life was greatly transformed physically, spiritually, and otherwise. So um, let me say it here that it is not a difficult thing to be alone with God. It's not a difficult thing to be alone with God. But being alone with God, it requires us to be, to be determined. Like I said earlier, it calls for our determination. It calls for our commitment. You know, it calls for our determination, number one. It calls for our commitment, and it calls for our discipline. We must be disciplined, and we have to be intentional about it. As we, as we put all these parameters in place, we gradually we begin to enjoy fellowship with God to the extent that most times we don't want to even stop. You know, we, we, re we read the account of um, Enoch that in Genesis, that you know, 
to actually spend all his days with God, fellowship together. So in the sense that when he went to heaven, he never knew. You know, it was like every day God would come to him to have fellowship. And after the talk, he would try to escort God to a certain point and uh, come back to his house. But on a particular day, he, he went. I never knew when he crosses the boundary. So the Bible says he was he was taken. Nobody knows where about he was taken. See, the Bible recorded that he was taken. God himself took him. So he went with God. He never tasted death. Hallelujah. So God enjoys our fellowship so much. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. The Bible says he normally comes to Adam and Eve at the close of the day to have fellowship with God. So fellowshiping with God is a central theme through the, throughout the Bible that led to profound transformation in the life of many biblical figures. Some of the examples that we're going to be looking at shortly. And it's my prayer that even as we look at these people and how they fellowship with God, it will inspire us more to strive in the place of fellowship with God in the name of Jesus Christ. Number one, we want to look at Abraham. You know, before Abraham became Abraham, he was Abraham. You know, he was Abraham. Only God knows what he saw in him when he called him out of his idolatrous background he, from all of childish. You know, God called him uh, because God has a plan for his life. And since then, he never looked back. So God started to fellowship with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 that we read in the scripture, where God called him out of his own kindred, and he promptly obeyed God. He promptly, promptly obeyed God. One thing that is key in fellowship with God, you know, God being a superior partner now, you know, God operates by, by covenant. He's a covenant keeping God. You know, he's a superior being. He's, he's superior than us. So we ought to subject to the, to, 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 to the spiritual brain, the one that knows more than all. So one of the things that is crucial in covenant is obedience, obedience to the superior being. Abraham, or Abraham at that particular time, when God called him Abraham, you know, he promptly obeyed God. And God gave him some series of instructions which he followed to the latter. It was not until when we got to Genesis chapter 17, that God began to give me further instructions. But look, this is, we, you and I, we are in a relationship now. These are some of the things that you need to do. So in every relationship, there are a set of rules, there are a set of things that we need to do. There are things that each partner will bring to the table to have a good fellowship one with another. You know, if you want to fellowship with somebody, you, must, you are expected to bring something on the table. So each partner, each, 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 each party will bring something on the table. So when you come to God, God expects us to bring some things on the table. And one of the things that God expects us to bring is one of his obedience. You need to come with obedience, you know, with the heart of obedience. So that whenever, whatever he asks us to do, we properly obey. Number two, God told Abraham now, in Genesis chapter 17, after his name has been changed to Abraham, after God has established his covenant with him, that, you know, you need to walk before me and be blameless. And be blameless, which means talks about being holy without fault. You know, holiness is also key and crucial in fellowship with God. We must call, we must approach the place of fellowship of God with holiness. And that's why uh, when we come into the presence of God, we must we must promptly confess our, our sins. We must search ourselves, search our heart. Is there any iniquity in me that God should forgive us so that we can enjoy that place of fellowship? So holiness is also key because the Bible says our God is holy. So if you want to fellowship with a God that is holy, you also must be ready to be holy. Because even the holiness of God will begin to rub on you that it will not be easy for you to go into the fellowship place of the law with sin or without being holy. And that's why most of the time, 
in our journey with the Lord, when you fall into sin, you find it hard to go and pray. You find it hard to go into the presence of God because it, it, it seems as if something will happen to you. So you quickly go and repent so that the the, the fellowship can be the the, the tie, the cord can be uh, connected back. The Bible says in First Peter chapter one, verse fifteen and sixteen, see. But as we, as he, which has called us is holy, so also we must be holy in all manner of conversation. So holiness is also key when we come to the presence of the Lord. Verse 16 says, say because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. So holiness is also key when it comes to the presence of God. So God instructed Abraham that now, now we have been in fellowship, we have been communicating together for a while. Now it's time for you to learn the way of holiness. Learn to walk before me, blameless, without fault. You know, if it's not possible, God will not ask us to do it. If God knows that something is not possible, he will not ask us to do it. And when God asks you to do something, what he wants to see in us is the willing heart, willingness of heart to do it. You know, it, it may seem uh, impossible for human, but the Bible says with God, all things are possible. Is it going to be the person that will help us to do it? We cannot do, so, do some of those things by our own power. We, it's, it's not possible we can we do them by our own effort. Is it the same God that will help us to do it? You know, it's the same God that set the, the exam. Is it still the same God that will teach us how to write the exam? So, what a loving father that we have in God. So, you know, this fellowship requires us some time to put our faith and trust into, into practice, into test. You know, God did that with Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 when he asked him, go and sacrifice your only son, Isaac. You know how long he waited before Isaac came. And after Isaac came, God said, has him say, go and sacrifice your only son, Isaac, on a particular mountain that I will, I will show you. The Bible says on that particular day, he took off, you know, with Isaac, with the instrument of sacrifice and every other thing, with fire and life, but there was no animal. So they went on a three days journey, him and his son and some other servant that helped them carry some wood and other, some material. So when they got to the place where it was to do the sacrifice. You know, the son was curious now, looking at this, yeah, I can see the knife, I can see the wood, I can see everything laid down, but where is the animal? But Abraham told him, said, the Lord will provide, and the Lord actually provided. So the Lord actually put him to sin, and he passed the test. He passed the test. So some of the time, as we fellowship with the Lord, our faith will be put to test. Our level of trust will be put to test. You know, in fact, that will happen constantly. Constantly. Your faith will be put to test. Your trust in him will be put to test. Your loyalty will be put to test. You know, some of us, when it comes to certain areas in, in our life, we, we normally tell God, God, those areas are no-go area. This ones belong to me. I'm in control here. Yeah, it's not supposed to be. God is supposed to be in control of everything in our life. Everything in our life, including our finances, our money in the bank. You know, everything that we got belongs to God. And whenever God says he wants, he is in need of them, we need to willingly be able to surrender those items to God. Because, you know, just like it was spoken of Abraham, I mean Abraham, he knew, he believed God, that God can raise him a, a, a child from the stone. He knew that God can do anything. So if it's the same God that has, provided, that has given him Isaac and is asking him to sacrifice Isaac back, he knew that God can bring other child unto him. So most of the time, our faith, our trust in God will be put to test. And I'm praying that when those times come, we will not faith God in the name of Jesus Christ. So Abraham passed all those tests. So he was, he became more intimate with God to the extent that the Bible calls him a friend of God. He became a friend of God. What a, what a privilege, what, what 
what a statement when they say somebody is a friend of God. You know, in, in James chapter 2, verse 23, I'm going to read it to us here, James chapter 2, and verse 23. That was where Abraham was called a friend of God. You know, I want to be a friend of God too, but it doesn't happen in one day. It comes after a long relationship in fellowship with God. James chapter 2, verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. So he came, not it doesn't happen overnight. He came after a series of tests, examination, trust, you know, believing, and all that. And God came to a conclusion that you are truly a friend, a friend. So Abraham became a friend of God, and after a series of uh, covenant that God made with him, and he became of faith that we are enjoying his blessing, if we all up to now. The Bible says, through him, the old heart shall be blessed. Even the nation of Israel and the Christian as, as a whole. Today, we are standing here, we are still enjoying the blessings of Abraham. And that's why the Bible says, for as many that believe in the Lord, both Jews and Greeks, and anyone, that the blessing of Abraham might come unto us, the Gentiles. The Gentile. So we are still enjoying the blessing of Abraham today because somebody walked with God, somebody fellowship with God wholeheartedly, and his life was transformed. And not only his life, his generations was transformed. And we are still talking about him today after he had long gone to be with the Lord. And even, do you know, uh, the Bible, when we in the, in the Old Testament, they, they normally call a place of uh, temporary rest. You know, when a believer dies, the Bible says it goes to the bosom of Abraham. Bosom of Abraham. So it's a temporary rest that believer goes to, or paradise. Call it either paradise or bosom or Abraham bosom in the Old Testament. But after Jesus had died, Jesus went to go and take all those sins from Abraham's bosom. He now takes them directly to the Lord Jesus Christ because nobody is actually qualified to go to God without the blood of Jesus. That's why all the sins that died before Jesus, including Moses, uh, Elijah, and all those, they were in the temporary place of rest called Abraham's bosom or a paradise. So they were there resting, the place of rest, temporary. Remember the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man. That was why the rich man saw, I mean, that was where the rich man saw Lazarus. The Bible says he saw Lazarus ahead, a pharaoh, and the bosom of Abraham. But after Jesus died, those three days he was in the grave, he went to that place, he went to hell to go and take the key from the devil. And they went to the paradise to take this saint right before God. And that's why when everybody dies now, the Bible says to be absent in the body is to be with the Lord. So when any, any saint dies now, anybody died in Christ, we are going straight to the presence of God, according to 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, 5, chapter 5, begin to read from verse 6 or so. So, if anybody dies in Christ now, we are going straight to the presence of God because we have access to the, to the presence of God through the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. So another person that had a good fellowship with God, in fact, an unusual fellowship with God is Moses. Moses had a unique relationship with God. You know, somebody that the Bible recorded that he was speaking with God face to face as man as one speaks with his friend in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, confirms that, that Moses was speaking with God face to face, mouth with mouth, as a man speaks with his friend. He had an unusual relationship with God, born at a time that was so dangerous, a time that he was not even given opportunity to survive. But God just did it miraculously. God protected him. 
at the time he was born, we, 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 we knew the story. A lot of male child that were born in Egypt then, in the land of Goshen in Egypt, were killed because of the king, or because of the decree of the king. A lot of them were killed. But Moses, because God wanted to use him, spared him alive. And he was survived. And he survived. To the extent that the very enemy that wanted to kill him was the same group that God used to raise him up. Eventually, he grew up in the king's palace. He was trained in all the arts of Egypt. So he was very knowledgeable. He has the knowledge, he was empowered to lead Israel out of Egypt. You know, we know the story. I won't bore with all those stories. But, you know, God saw leadership quality in him and God chose him to lead his people. That was why he was trained right in the, in the in, with the people. I mean, he was trained by the people that wanted to kill him as a child. What a privilege that he had. And we know his story, how he wanted to deliver. He knew himself that God has ordained him to deliver the people of Israel. So most of the time, he would go out in the camp, defend Israel against Egypt. When he, he saw, I mean, when he sees two of them in conflict, he would defend the Israel, Israelites against the Egyptians. So he did that for some while. But one day, when he knew that, you know, what he was doing had been exposed to the king. So he had to he flee, he fled for his life. You know, we know the story. Until after about 40 years, when the Lord called him back in a strange experience, when he saw a, a, a bush that was burning, but the, 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 and it was not consumed. The fire was burning the bush, and the bush was not consumed. And the Lord spoke to him. I initially he began to give some excuses that I cannot talk. Maybe that was why God made sure that, you know, that mouth that we say you cannot talk with, me, you and I will be speaking mouth to mouth. You and I will be speaking mouth to mouth. Don't worry. I will be, I will, I will change that mouth. And eventually we know what happened. God used him out to, I mean, to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You know, God used him mightily. He was a man that lost fellowship with, with God. He would never do anything without asking God. You know, as the Lord gave him instruction, remember, I told us earlier that in fellowship with, fellowshiping with God, obedience is key. In fact, it's the same obedience that led to Moses' inability to lead the people to the promised land. Eventually, for once in his life, he never obeyed God to the latter. You know, he disobeyed God. Disobeyed God's instruction. So obedience is key in fellowshipping. So God used Moses through, her, through fellowshipping with God to give Israel the law also. You know, remember the, the law, the commandment, when we normally call the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, it was through the hand of Moses that God delivered the law to the nation of Israel. It was through his hand. In fact, those law was written on tablets of, of, of stone by the finger of the Lord himself. And you remember what happened? The first law that was written by the finger of the Lord was broken by Moses. You know, after he had gone to, he was in the presence of God to receive the law, by the time he came back to the camp, the nation of Israel were already doing other things, you know, already following other gods. So he had to, he, 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 he he, in anger, he broke the, the, the tablet of stone written by the finger of the Lord. But the Lord called him again that, okay, I will, you, I, will, I will give you another one. But this time around, you are going to write it by your own hand. So the second one was actually written by Moses himself through the dictate of God. God was dictating it to Moses. So Moses wrote the, those ones, second one, by his own hand. So it was a it was a man also that enjoyed unbroken relationship with God, you know, unbroken relationship with God. You know, Moses enjoyed tremendous fellowship with God. God Himself testified that he was a different prophet from all other prophets. You know, he said, "This one I speak with him mouth to mouth." Let me read Numbers chapter twelve, verse six to eight. Numbers chapter twelve, 
persist to it. God says, concerning Moses, this, this one uh, is not ordinary prophet. Too. It's not an ordinary prophet. It's a man that I speak with mouth to mouth. So don't joke with this one. Numbers chapter 6, verse 12 to 8. And he said, hear now my word. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision. And we speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses is not so. So which means it's, it's different from all other or any other prophet. Say, who is faithful in all my house? With him, I, I with him will I speak mouth to mouth, even apparently, and not in dark speeches, and the similitude of the law shall he behold. Wherefore then. Why are you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? So he said, this, this is not just an ordinary prophet. It's, it's somebody that me and him will speak mouth to mouth. So testify of that of Moses. You know, and you know, Moses enjoyed the presence of the Lord. To the extent that one of those times that he went to be with the Lord, I mean, he went to fellowship with the Lord. He came back, his face was shining with the glory of God. That the people of Israel could not look at it. So they had to start to look for clothes to cover his face because of the glory that was that was upon him. According to Exodus chapter 30, if we read from verse 29 to 35, Exodus chapter 34, rather, sorry. Exodus chapter 34 from verse 29 to 35. So uh, Moses also was somebody that enjoyed the presence of God. Many days he was in the presence of God. Forty days without food, enjoying the presence of God, fasting, you know. And even when he died, there was a contention over his body, you know, by an angel and the devil. And it was a quite some fight that the, devil, the, the angel won the devil. And even up to now, nobody knows where uh, his corpse was buried. I'm talking about Moses, you know. Jude chapter 1, verse, verse 9, talks about the angel that fought with, with the devil over his, his body. So these are people that enjoy tremendous fellowship with God. And, you know, God used them mightily. Even in our days, if you want God to use you mightily, you need to set time aside to fellowship with God. You know, if there's one thing that God cherishes most, is our fellowship. He wants us to fellowship with him regularly regularly, regularly, and as, at a particular time, we need to be consistent about it. You know, we need to be consistent. It's not just uh, prayer alone. When you go to fellowship with God, there are a lot of things that, we, that, that goes into play. You know, we're not talking about going there to pray alone. Many of us thought when we go to the presence of God, it's only just to pray. No. You know, when you, uh, just like I, I told us last week, when you Go with your friends for fellowship. There are so many things that you do together. You laugh together. You gist. You know, you discuss issues, past issues, present issues, future, and all that together. So those are some of the things that, you know, we enjoy when we go into the place of fellowship with God. God begins to tell us what is going to happen in the, in the future. He begins to tell us what happened in the past. And, you know, we have privilege to certain informations that ordinary people will not, will not have privilege to, to, to have. So those are those some of the things that we enjoy when we fellowship with the Lord. What about David, the top person that we're going to talk about tonight? David also was a man that was given to um, awesome fellowship with the Lord. He was described a man after God's own heart. You know, he never came like that. He came through fellowship with God. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 14, the same was also written in Acts of Apostles chapter 13, verse 13, verse 22. But well, let me read 1 Samuel to Ross. 1 Samuel chapter 13, and verse 14. The Bible says, But now thy kingdom shall not, shall not continue. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be captain over his people. 
because thou has not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. You know, he was talking about Saul, when the kingdom was taken away from Saul. So um, let me read Acts of Apostles again, Acts of Apostles chapter 13, Acts of Apostles chapter 13, verse 22. Acts of Apostles chapter 13, verse 22. The Bible says, and when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. You know, that was the testimony of God concerning David. He said, I found this one, a man after my own heart. You know. God is telling you that you are you are after his own which means uh, he holds you is dearly. You know, when you when you fall in love with somebody, the person is always in your heart. You hold that person dearly in your heart. That's the same story that God was portraying here concerning David. Say, this man is a man after my own heart. So David never failed to seek the Lord guidance in any of the issues that he wants to embark on. It's a man that was totally committed, determined, and disciplined to always seek the face of God on any issues that pertain to his life. You know, he came from an humble beginning, you know, rearing sheep and animals in the bush when, you know, he was to be anointed as king. He was forgotten in the bush. It was, it was great that funding, you know, as is then, God has not stopped using him. We know what he did. Even when he was in the bush, he testified to the fact that there was, he fought the lions, he fought the bear, he conquered them in the bush. And when he was anointed, he fought with Goliath that everybody dreaded, and he won. So David was actually the first king that God ordained by himself. Saul was the first king in Israel, but it was the people's choice. God chose that. God chose Saul for them because he knew that those that is the kind of person that would be wanted. You know, the nation of Israel, God was supposed to be their king. God never had a plan to, to give them king. You know, God has given them, God has been guiding them through the laws and the prophets. You know, all this why when they were in the wilderness. But a time came when they saw other nations also with king. So they became envied of them. Say, ah, we want king too. We want to be like other nations too. Oh, God said, oh, you want king. So you don't want me as your king any longer. So God was, was displeased with them. After much agitations, they were, you know, agitation from the people to Samuel and all that. Samuel, God now said, okay, Samuel, no, don't worry. I'm going to give them a king that they want. Okay, they want somebody that will be leading them to war. That's what they want. That was what, I mean, that was why God went for Saul. And the Bible says, from the shoulder up, Saul was taller than everybody in, in the land of Israel. So he's, he's a huge man. He was a huge man that can lead in battle. That's what the people want. So Saul was actually the people's choice. But David was God's choice. He was a man that ordinarily we would not choose. He was not the the eldest. He was not the the tallest. He was just he was unnoticeable. So most of the time, if even all of the time, people that God chooses, they are always the weakest people. I mean, so that God will demonstrate His power in them, so that they will know that oh, God is at work in this world, and that's why you and I we have been chosen by God. We are not the wisest. We are not the knowledgeable. We are not the most knowledgeable. We are not the most schooled. You know, but God has chosen us to show the, to prove to the world that his power can make a difference in a man's life. And that's what can make a difference. The power of God is the, the only thing that can make a difference in a man's life. Hallelujah. You know, Everybody is celebrating the president now, you know, like the number one citizen of, um, of the world, the president of America. It's like the number one citizen of the world. But even, even if he does not have the power of God, mm -hmm. he's nobody. An ordinary 
priesthood with the power of God is greater than him. You know, because when he sleeps, and witches and wizards begin to chase him in the night now. I mean, they won't say he's the president. They will chase him out of the bed, chase him everywhere. You know, because he does not have the power of God. I'm not saying he doesn't have the power of God, but if he does not have, you know, people will be tormenting him. Witches and wizards will be tormenting him. And he will be running for his dear life. But ordinary Christian or noticeable person with the power of God who is going to be uh, in charge of, of his life and destiny. So that's why the Bible says the one that is least in the kingdom is, is greater than those ones. So David also enjoyed a, a wide range of fellowship with God. You know, he wrote many psalms, expressing his love and trust in the Lord with thanksgiving. You know, he was a man that God used so much to, to write many psalms in the scripture. Psalm 34, Psalm 18, Psalm 25, Psalm 91, Psalm 35, and a whole lot of psalms that he wrote, expressing his love for God, his trust in the Lord, and his thanksgiving to the Lord for what, for what God has done for him. Because to him, he was not even the most qualified for the role of the king, but God chose him. You know, it was, I mean, nobody even reckoned with him. He has been forgotten. He has been left in the backside of the forest. You know, when Samuel came to anoint one of the sons of Jesse as king, they brought all other ones and he was left. Even the father had forgotten him. It was God that said, okay, they, are, they are put it in the mind of the prophet. He said, and is this, are this only the only son that you have? So then, so then at that point, that the father remembered that, oh, they are still have one. Is with the animals in the bush. He said, okay, well, go and send, send for him now. We will not sit until he comes. So David knew that what he's enjoying, ordinary is not qualified for him. But God has cho God just chosen him to, to have all those things, to enjoy all those things. And he was a man that enjoyed so much privilege from the Lord that, you know, try his military uh, days, tries, kinship, he never lost any battle. He never lost any battle. The only battle he lost was the battle of the flesh. David never lost any battle because he will always inquire from the Lord what to do, which is also key in fellowshipping. You know, when we come to the place of fellowship with God, it's not just to, to worship, it's not just to pray. We inquire, we dialogue with the Lord. God, what, 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 what am I going to do? How do I do this? How do I do that? You know, it's a time for us to have a dialogue with God. It's a time for us to really pour our mind onto God. You know, just like I said earlier, you know, when we fellowship, it's a lot of things goes in place. You know, you, you talk, talk back to you. And that's why, you know, prayer has been boring for most of us Christians, you know, and, you know, when we come to prayer, we, we always drag our foot because we have not really broken that realms that, of fellowship that we need to break. So when you break that realm and you come to the place of true fellowship with, with the Lord, you will not want to, to come out of it. Prayer will become easy. You know, fellowship will become easy. You know, just like you are, you are having fellowship with some, somebody you really love. You know, you don't want to end the fellowship. You want to be with it together forever. You know, so that time prayer will be easy because it's, it's fellowshipping with God. So it was a man that never lost anybody. God made a covenant with him, made a covenant with David, promising him that his throne will be established. Of course, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ came out of his own lineage. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 to 16, God made a covenant with me, say, say your, your, your throne is going to be established. And God is keeping that promises today. So David was also somebody that had a tremendous fellowship with God. He knows how to catch God. He knows what the Lord wants. You know, I, I, I'm telling us, what the Lord wants in us is, is fellowshipping. He wants us to fellowship with him. It's not when we are in need or when we are boxed to a corner that you, that you run to God. You know, all the time, he wants us around to be called. You know, 
You know, I normally tell some people, you know, when, when they need you is where they call, you know. And when you are in need and you call somebody, you know, another time, where you, you, where your everything is okay with you. You don't remember to call the person. It's only when you are in need. That's that's how some of us treat God also. It's only when we are in need that we run to him. It's not supposed to be. Every time we need to be in constant fellowship. Even when you are in constant fellowship, you, sometimes you don't even need to open your mouth before he will say, okay, ah, uh, okay, are you sure you are okay? Why don't you take this? You know, why don't you do this? Why don't you take this one? Why don't you have this one? But, you know, most of us we have formed that habit of it's only where you need, you know, we call it dump and use, you or use and dump. You know, it's not always good. We need to maintain constant relationship with God, you know, and that's where we can enjoy that relation. That's where we can enjoy and live a fulfilled life that God has or I mean ordained us to live. There are so many of them in the scripture that time may not permit to also to talk about. We also have Elijah, a man that God used so much. Also, you know, God used to do many uncommon miracles. You know, he was a, a prophet of fire. You know, he called down fire several times in the scripture. You know, remember at, at Mount Kame, fire came down. And in Second Kings two, Second King one also, you know, when the king sent the host of army to go and arrest him. Three times he called down fire. No wonder when he was about leaving, so he went to heaven without death, tasting death. He went with the chariot of fire, he went to heaven in chariot of fire. So he was a prophet of fire. God used him so much, and he had a good relationship with God too, because he always hear from God. Remember, he was a prophet that prophesied that there would not be rain in the land. He didn't say according to the word of God. Say there will not be rain in this land according to my word. That's what he said. Go and check it out in First Kings chapter seventeen. Begin to read from verse one. Say there will not be rain in this land according to my word. He didn't say according to the word of God. So he was a man that hears directly from the Lord. And when it was time to bring the rain after the contest of Mount Carmel, you know when fire came down, you know. Everybody was wondering, okay, what next now? He told the king, say, I can hear the sound of abundance of rain. I can hear the sound of abundance. Of... Even there was no cloud at that particular time. There was no sign, no nothing to show that there would be rain. But Elijah told King Ahab, you better run quickly to, to your house because I can hear the sound of abundance of rain. And Elijah now sent his servant to go and check, you know, that one went seven times before he can begin to see the sign of, of cloud gathering like the palm, than the size of the palm of the hand of man. Eventually, it rained. So, it was a man that hear clearly. God, you think, what about Daniel? Daniel also, God uh, exhibited good, uh, I mean, good time, fellowship with God, even in the foreign land. You and I, most of us, we are in a foreign land. It doesn't debar us from having good fellowship with God. God, I mean, Daniel excelled in foreign land because he was a man that was always fellowship with God. What about Apostle Paul, Job, and all that in the Bible? You know, you and I can have a good time of fellowship with God. And it's always to our advantage because God begins to repeat things to us that even we will not be able to to even share with people. And I'm praying that God will give us grace to fellowship with him the way he wants us to fellowship with him in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So by the grace of God, we will continue next week as the Lord Jesus Christ tarries. God bless you all. Come and sir. You are on, you are muted, sir. You are muted, sir. Hello, sir. Okay, better now. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Pastor Maria is there with me. He has one or two things to say. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I just want to bless God that uh, God called us. The Bible says, Blessed are those whom the Lord calleth and draweth near to dwell in his tabernacle, but they will enjoy all the good things that comes out of the altar. I want to thank God because we are enjoying the good things that comes out of the altar of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Another thing that I just want to thank God that he is a faithful God. The Bible says, if you love the Lord, he loves you back with benefits. Our own is just, just love the Lord. His own is loving us with benefits. That benefit includes protection, good life, name it. That even in the bed of sickness, he will raise you up and he has been doing it. Amen. So my advice is that let us keep on being in good tune with him. Let us keep on obeying this God. Let us love the Lord and obey him. And then, you know, the Bible says, many are called, but few are chosen. And we are among the few that we are so blessed, so lucky that God chose us to walk with him. We pray that God will continue to enrich us with his power, and enrich us with more anointing, to continue to serve him, to continue to walk with him. See, I no, I no longer call you servant, but I call you friend. Now all of us we are friends of God because of the relationship we have with him. So I pray that God will continue, you know, to keep us alive and make us to be in tune with him forever. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us pray. The King of glory, we thank you. Thank you, Father. The ancient of days will bless your name. Hallelujah. What an opportunity to be called a friend of God. Mm. What an opportunity to be called a friend of the Creator. Yes. Mm. You can imagine if we're called a friend of the President of America, mm. <laughs> who we'll have our heads swollen as if we were extraordinary. Mm. Talk less of now being called a friend of God. Mm. Let us pray that God himself will grant us grace to be able to appropriate this unique position mm. in his in his, you know, in, in, in his presence, the unique position that we enjoy, the unique position that we occupy, that he himself will be able to educate us mm -hmm. so that we'll be able to use that position to the benefit of humanity in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father so, Lord, we appreciate you. We thank you because you are so awesome. No one can be compared with you. Amen. You are so good that you could humble yourself to the level of allowing the people you create to become your friends. Mm -hmm. People <laughs> who treated you so badly, people who do not trust you absolutely, but you still gave all the opportunities. And you gave us a hope that none would have given us. Mm -hmm. We magnify your name for this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. We thank you, Lord, 
for physically demonstrating this love by sending your son Jesus to us. Mm -hmm. Set us free. And to keep our position intact, Lord, we say, be that we are exalted forever in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Lord, the journey is still short and far. Short in the sense that a million years is like seconds in your eyesight. Hmm. But we know that whatever number of years that is remaining for us on this planet had. We want to enjoy your your you know your friendship, mm -hmm. your mm -hmm. you know your mentorship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Jesus. So Please like and share our videos, and also don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.